Well, hello and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church's Weekend Worship Online. Pastor Brett here along with our tremendous tech team of Tom and Tanya. And together, we want to say how wonderful it is to have you as a part of our worship experience this weekend. So how has your week been? Was it a good one for myself? It has been a great week for a variety of reasons, not the least of which uh, this is the third day in a row I have been able to wear a short sleeve shirt. I don't think that has happened for nine months here in Oregon and and I believe just maybe we are finally into summer which is always a cause for celebration in our state. Um, I hope you've been able to get out and enjoy uh, some of this and it's just as always a reminder of God's rhythm, perfect rhythm, knowing just the amount of rain that we need, just the amount of sunlight that we need and while it seems to be a little bit rarer here than in other parts of the country, we do celebrate and rejoice in that. And I hope that is sort of the sentiment you felt this past week, a, a renewed invigoration as you feel not only the sunlight um, on the outside, but God's light, the sun's light on the inside as well. We're going to do a little bit of worshiping today. We're going to do some praying. We're going to look to God's Word. But we're going to open with a great song. It's sort of a medley or a tie together. You'll know the words, well, the tune's a little bit unique. The title is Rock of Ages You Will Stand. And I, I love the title of this because it reminds us of that foundation that is unwavering in God. Uh, one of the interesting things that's come out this past week is uh, the Food and Drug Administration either already did or is about to put some new regulations on the tobacco industry, requiring them to reduce the amount of nicotine in cigarettes. Um, now, I don't think that's a bad thing. My mom uh, was impacted by cigarette smoking um, throughout her lifetime. But to, to me, it's just a, a reminder of the craziness of the day and age in which we live. So, uh, so uh, the FDA is really concerned about not having too much nicotine in cigarettes. But here in Oregon, it's okay if you have cocaine or heroin, or methamphetamines, or oh, whatever it might be. So if you're a drug company, you can get a big fine if there's just a little bit too much nicotine, but if you want to have these harder drugs here in Oregon, uh, that's okay. Maybe you understand that. I don't get it, um, but that's okay. Um, because I don't look to the things of the world, I look to my foundation in Christ, which is unwavering. It is that bedrock upon which we stand. So let's do some singing about that as we begin our time of worship here this day.
Well, he is the rock of ages, not only of, of this life, but of all of eternity. And again, um, how much comfort that provides me, perhaps you as well. We're going to shift gears here um, as we think about um, this one who never changes is the same yesterday, today, and forever by going to him in a time and a season of prayer. So let me invite you, if you would, to please spend a few moments with me as we pray for our community and actually for our world today. Let's spend some time in prayer. Almighty Father, how we thank you for this day. How we thank you, Lord, uh, as we've already mentioned for this week, uh, to see the sun shining, to bask in the warmth, Lord, of um, a part of your creation that we don't always get to experience uh, here in the Northwest. But as we feel that, God, it is just a rejuvenating presence in our soul. It is a reminder to us. God, of the perfect rhythm of seasons that you've uh, put in place from the very beginning. Uh, so that is as appropriate. We might get the moisture that's needed, but also, uh, Father, that that sun can shine down and provide the growth uh, that's also required um, for us to be able to enjoy the, the, the food that we partake of, as well as the beauty of the creation you have given to us. We thank this day, Lord, of some of the needs that are existing within our, our church family. Father, we, we begin with words of praise for the fact that Mark is up and about uh, after a, a very long convalescing period following an injury way back at the beginning of the year. Lord, he's not 100%, and so we ask that your hand would continue to rest upon him. But it's so good to see him mobile and out and about. May you continue to watch over him. Uh, Father, we uh, would pray for uh, Kate as she grieves the passing of her mother, Elaine. Lord, we know that that was not a complete surprise, and yet it leaves a, a void in her life and the life of her family, and so might you be a special source of comfort and of peace to them. We think of Andrew, Lord, who has uh, requested a variety of different individuals that he would love to come see him as he has relocated to to Arizona. Um, God, those social connections are so important to him. And so we just ask that somehow you might arrange, whether it be in person or even just by phone, an opportunity for Andrew to connect with some of those that he hasn't spoken to for a while. Lord, on a personal note, um, I'd ask that you uh, be with my family as um, we have some issues that we're wrestling with in terms of parents for my dad as he continues to recover from his traffic accident. I thank you for the improvements that are being seen, but he's still got a ways to go, Father. And so might that healing process, which has begun, be brought to completion. And then I would also pray for Anne's mom, a father who's had um, an increasingly challenging um, health issues that she's been dealing with and, and, and probably, Lord, is, is moving um, toward that that time in which she's going to be with you. And so we just ask that you would watch over her, comfort her in the pain that she's experiencing. And God, remind her um, of that blessing of eternity that awaits when this life is over. Beyond our uh, church and, and our families, Lord, we think of some of the things happening in the world. We pray for those in Afghanistan who are recovering from the tragic earthquake there. Uh, such an impoverished nation that just doesn't have the resources even uh, to engage in the in the rescue attempts. So uh, may your hand be upon them in a special way. And then, uh, God, once again, we come to you on behalf of those in U Ukraine. Uh, Lord, they continue to, to struggle in the day-to-day -day issues um, as they seek to resist those who are attempting to invade their country. Uh, Lord, it's, it's starting to move into the, the, the place where it, uh, to us, it sounds like old news, and yet to them, every single day is incredibly real. And so may we retain that sensitivity to what they're struggling with. Father, may we continue to keep them in prayer, um, asking as we have from the beginning, Lord, um, that peace might uh, reign in that place uh, rather than the guns and bullets um, that are so prevalent at the moment. Be with us now as we look to your word, our Father, open our hearts and minds to all that you would have us to hear, to take in this day. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, time to look to God's word. Let me invite you to grab your Bibles. Uh, if you haven't already done so, 
Uh, maybe it's your personal Bible, maybe it's your uh, Bible app, whatever it is. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter. Come back to that in, in just a moment. But as we begin our sermon time this morning, you know, as I was growing up, and even yet today, uh, when I look at Sunday morning comics, one of my favorite is a comic entitled Family Circus. It's a, a depiction of a family with lots of little children, and it captures the joys and some of the challenges that go along with having uh, little ones. And one of the themes that they uh, visit on a fairly regular basis is, is what it means uh, for the kids to get from point A to B. And now it never seems to go quite directly. And so as the, uh, the slide will show you, in the case of Billy here, he's up at the, at the bus stop at the very upper left-hand corner, but in order to get to mom's at the lower left-hand corner, he takes uh, somewhat of an indirect route. I mention this because I feel like that's how this sermon series may end up going for us. Uh, we started several weeks ago by uh, starting off with uh, this uh, theme that we have, real life, real struggles, real answers. We began by spending a couple weeks talking about struggling through stress. Um, and then we had a, a few weeks of break. Um, I had to attend to some family issues and uh, we had a celebration with Father's Day last week. We're back to things now, but I'm sensing that there may be some more breaks coming up, but that's okay. Um, each one is kind of standalone in and of itself. And so we're gonna move forward by today looking at this new theme that's in front of us, which is entitled Fighting Off Failure. Fighting off failure. And I think it's appropriate because who amongst us has not experienced failure at some point of our lives? It just happens with everybody. Sometimes more than others, admittedly, but we've all experienced it, haven't we? Uh, no matter what our best efforts might be, it just seems like in some occasions that things don't quite pan out as we had hoped. Maybe for you, it's happened in, in the school setting. Maybe you had a particular class you really wanted to, to do well in. And so, yeah, you particularly dedicated yourself to making sure you kept up with the assignments. You, you read all of the, the pages, the books you were supposed to read. You, you did all of the reports. You prepared for the test. You even did the extra credit. And yet, despite all of the effort you put in, you still ended up with a C. Or maybe for you, it has to do in the area of relationships. Maybe you're in the, the midst of a marriage where you, you're, you're wanting to strengthen it, or um, maybe you're just wanting to keep it alive. And so you've gone to the counseling and, and you've done the things that the counselor suggested, and you're seeing maybe a little bit of progress, but it is so slow, baby steps at best. Or maybe it has to do with the workplace. Uh, you're wanting to, to move up in the company in order to, uh, to get a better position or maybe so you can better provide for your family. And so you've been putting in lots of extra effort, working extra weekends, uh, extra nights, and yet despite all that extra time and effort you've invested, nobody seems to notice. And what ends up happening is you become a little discouraged over that. You end up becoming disillusioned. And if that happens over a prolonged period of time, you be can begin to feel a little bit or maybe a lot like you're just not measuring up, like you're uh, somewhat of a failure. And so what is it that we can do to, uh, to move beyond that? Well, uh, one of the things I think is, is we recognize and celebrate the fact that God in his infinite wisdom, knowing that that would be one of the things that all of us would struggle at from time to time, has made one of the pillars of our faith this concept of hope, uh, this recognition that in Christ things always have the possibility of, uh, of getting better for us. Um, that for me, it's one of the things I lean on constantly, and there's all kinds of scriptures that speak to this. Um, uh, it reminds us of that truth uh, that failure is something that we do, not someone that we are. Uh, let me say that again. Failure is something you do, not someone you are. Because we've all been fearfully and wonderfully made by God. He has a great plan for our lives if we'll just allow that plan to be worked through Him in our existence. And so we hold on, we embrace, we wrap our arms around the sense of hope that God gives us. Uh, hope that's spoken of in passages like Romans 15, 13 that says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's that sense of hope that allows us to know that, uh, that there can be, will be better days ahead for us. 
So with that basic foundation of hope, then how is it that we can go ahead and fight off the sense of failure that still has a tendency to creep into our lives from time to time? Oh, we're going to look at some points that help us with that as we turn to our text from today for today, which again is found in the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter. We're going to begin there with the very first verse, go down through verse 11. Um, the first part there is on your screen. You can follow along. And so uh, let's read uh, those opening passages in Luke 5. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is just another name for the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Jesus just got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little bit from shore. Then Jesus sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. When the, he had finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your net for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. I'm not going to put the rest of the, on the screen, but uh, go ahead and follow along with me in your Bibles as we uh, read, beginning there with verse 7 and continuing on. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up to shore, left everything, and followed him. As we look to this text, we see a, a number of different points. In fact, we're going to kind of focus on four this day that I think help us uh, discover ways that we can fight off that feeling of failure that, that tries to, to creep in. And we begin with this idea, uh, this recognition that one of the, the first things that that Peter did in this story was that he allowed Jesus into his life, more specifically allowed Jesus into his boat. In verse 3 of that fifth chapter, it says this once more, Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then Jesus sat down. Now, as you think, think about how the story unfolds, we, we recognize that first, uh, Peter lets Jesus into the boat, which is really kind of representative of his life, and then the blessings come. And I think there's a particular order that's replicated in our lives as well. It seems like uh, first we have to make God a part of our lives, and then uh, we can see those blessings come uh, upon us. That, that process of experiencing that miracle catch that, that Peter and the other uh, disciples or the followers there would come to know. Um, came only about as Peter had allowed Jesus into his life. Now, it talks here about letting him into his boat, but for Peter, that really was his office. That was his workspace. That was his cubicle. Uh, when I did chaplaincy work uh, for the police department as a volunteer for a number of years, one of the, the things I would say, in fact, typically the very first thing I would say when I climbed into their squad car was, hey, so-and-so, uh, say, Bill, I, I know that this is your space. This is your office. And so I want to do everything that I can that would help. Uh, tell me anything that, that I'm doing that would hinder that because I want to respect this. This is your office space. Well, for Peter, that boat was his office. And what we see is that Peter invited, welcomed Jesus, uh, not only into his life, but into his office space, into his work life. One of the things I, I see often in the lives of Christians is that we're, we're great about inviting Jesus into certain areas of our life. We're great about welcoming him on Sunday mornings or uh, maybe at a Bible study midweek or maybe he's there as a part of our devotions. It's great to have God there. But when it comes to the other areas, we're much more reluctant, much more resistant. One of those areas often is our work life, our work space. And yet God wants to be a part of that too. He wants to be a part of our Sunday mornings. He wants to be a part of our Bible studies. 
but he also wants to be a part of our family. He wants to be a part of our hobbies. He wants to be a part of that work life. And so one of the questions we, I think, have to ask ourselves is, how often do we do that? How often do we look for opportunities to include God as a part of our work experience? Do we have eyes, do we have ears attuned to that kind of thing? And it might unfold in, in, in a manner such as this. Maybe uh, you're uh, working with a, a co-worker and, and you notice that on that particular day they're a little bit more distracted than usual. Or you're, you're talking to a manager or a supervisor and they just seem um, not their normal self. They're a little bit more depressed, a little bit more discouraged. Or you, or, or you come up uh, maybe to a, a vendor or maybe there's a, a, a maintenance worker there who, who is just um, they just seem to be dragging a little bit. Do you seize those moments that God's presented to you and, and take advantage of that? Now, I'm not saying that you have to whip out the four spiritual laws and, and, and uh, go through the whole track with them, but you can begin the process. You can begin by asking them, hey, uh, Bill, I, I noticed you're just not um, quite as as chipper as you normally are, and I'm not trying to intrude here, but is everything okay? Is there anything I can do? Uh, Sally, I, I noticed that you're a, a little bit more discouraged than usual. Is there anything that I can go on? I've had some discouraging moments too. I'm here to help if there's any way that I, I can assist. You just open that door and then you see where the Spirit leads. Maybe they'll say something to you. Maybe they won't. But if they do, we all have those lies where we can point them toward that which gives us that sense of hope, that thing that has gotten us through those difficult times, and that's our walk with God. We don't have to hit them over the head with the Bible. We just have to tell them our story, how God has been there to guide us, to lead us, to encourage us, to comfort us in our experiences like that. So as we look to this story here, one of the things that we see that, that Peter did in order to, uh, to move beyond that sense of, of a failure was to include Jesus in, in all areas of his life, in, in this particular context, into his boat. Second, we see that he submitted to God's direction in his life. Uh, Jesus asked if he could get in the boat and, and uh, Peter agreed to that initially, and then after Jesus had taught for a while, and then he tells or asks Peter if, if he could go out and put his nets down in, in the water, in the, in, the, in the deeper water. It says it this way in verse 4. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Uh, Peter didn't whine when Jesus said that. Would have been easy to do. I mean, Peter had a pretty full day already. He'd had a long night. They'd put in a lot of time and effort. Um, he, he didn't say that he was the expert fisherman, and if, if there were fish out there, he would have found them. He didn't complain about Jesus waiting until after the nets were already cleaned. In my mind, I would have thought, Jesus, why couldn't he be asked me to do this 20 minutes ago or a half hour before I got everything cleaned up? Instead, he just responds and does what Jesus asked. Now, that doesn't mean that he did it blindly. I mean, uh, he did express his uh, feeling in the midst of all of that. Um, there was an honest obedience that went along with that. In the fifth verse of that passage, it says, Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. He acknowledged that they'd already tried their best to do things, that there'd already been some effort that had been exerted. He, he was honest about that. But still, he was obedient to what God had asked him to do. As a part of that, we see that one of the things that Peter didn't do was that he, he didn't follow just his feelings. Again, his feelings would probably have been, a, have been inclined to uh, cause him to, to not want to do that. Once more, he'd worked very hard all night long, hadn't borne any fruit uh, from that. I suspect that he was a little discouraged by that, maybe even a little bit embarrassed. He was the expert, he was the professional, he was the, the, the paid fisherman, and yet uh, at the end of all of that effort, he had goose eggs, a big zero as far as, as what he was able to bring in. And yet despite all of this, he did what Jesus asked. And I wonder for us how often that's our response to God or 
Uh, do we find excuses or reasons not to do uh, what Jesus might say? When you feel that nudging, when you feel that prompting of the Holy Spirit to, to talk to someone or take a particular action or, or to go to this place or that, do you say, God, I'm a little tired, but I'm going to do it? Or do we say, God, I'm tired, maybe another day? It seems to me that the, the pattern of today's world is, is so often to put our own wants, our own desires, our own demands in place of those of God. And in fact, I kind of referred to it as the cultural and sadly, I think even the Christian trifecta that goes something like this. This is my life, God. I'm in charge of it. Uh, two, I know what's best for me. And we often pick up in their intonation that they think they know what's best for us as well. And then finally, because of that, they decide that they're going to do what they want to do. Now, maybe that's best for the other person. Maybe that's best for themselves. But they're the ones who get to decide that. And yet, as we embrace this widespread rejection of authority, not just authority in, in terms of our, our government or communities, but in terms of God as well, where does that let us? Increasingly, we see uh, uh, disharmony. We see uh, even chaos and, and anarchy at the edges of our society. For Peter, he was willing to be obedient. And not just the obedient to, to put the boat out, but specifically it says that Jesus asked him to put the boat out in deeper water. He risked going to the deeper water. If you can remember back to when you were growing up, you probably took uh, swimming lessons as a part of that. And oftentimes uh, they're done in pools that, uh, you know, start at, at the shallow end and it goes deeper. And the, the teacher will go out and, and they'll uh, invite the person or the little child to swim toward them. And maybe they'll step back uh, four or five feet and have the child swim. And, and then when they come, they applaud that, they, they affirm them. And then they step back another three feet and ask them to swim that length. And then a little bit farther and a little bit farther. And the farther out that the teacher moves, the, the riskier it becomes for the child because they reach a point where their feet can't touch the bottom anymore. They're moving into the deep water, the deep end. And we know even as children that there's a risk associated with that. Uh, our, our feet can't touch the bottom. We can't see things that are, or that are, that are down underneath. It's, it's in the deep end that people drown or even worse. But it's also the deep end, at least in terms of the fishing, where the best fish are found. And so Jesus encourages Peter to take that risk to go into the deeper water. It's harder work to get out further into the lake. There's greater risk associated, but there's also greater reward that comes from that. Jesus intended for Peter to experience great blessings. But for him to do that, he needed, first of all, uh, to invite Jesus into his boat. And second of all, he needed to be willing to go out, uh, particularly uh, to the deeper water. I'm not sure if you can hear the siren. It's going by us. So let me just pray real quick. Lord, we don't know the need, but we know someone has cried out. And so be with the emergency responders. May your hand be upon them, as well as those that find themselves in need. In Christ's name, amen. So we see, uh, as we look at the story, that, uh, that G Peter welcomed Jesus into the, the boat, that he submitted to God. And then thirdly, uh, that there was a sense of confidence, of faith, of belief uh, that God would answer uh, Peter's prayers, the, the desires of Peter's heart. Again, in that fifth verse, it says this, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. I don't think... Peter would have done that if he thought there was no chance of, of catching something. He had a sense of confidence, a sense of, of, of belief there in, in, in Jesus and what Jesus uh, could do. And what we see is that in that process that, that Peter's eyes were open to something extraordinary, not just the miracle of the catch, though that was uh, phenomenal. But we read a little bit later in that eighth verse, these words, when Simon Peter saw this, when he saw the great number of fish that had been caught, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Uh, Peter's prayers were, were answered not only in terms of, of having adequate supplies that he could uh, feed his family with, that he could uh, pay his partners with, that he could get additional supplies that might be needed, but it exceeded that far and beyond. 
Peter wanted God to intervene in his life. He was thinking in terms of catching fish. But God had something more. Because he wanted Peter not just to catch fish. As the text tells us, he wanted him to become a fisher of men. A fisher of souls. And so we see, again, that as we think about what it means to, to move beyond this, this idea of failure that can consume us, that can capture our hearts from time to time, that, that we overcome that as we welcome Jesus into our lives, all of our lives, that we overcome that as, as we're faithful and obedient to His teachings and instructions, that we overcome that as we have that sense of confidence and belief in Him because of what we've seen already oftentimes Him do in our lives. And, and then finally, as we acknowledge of kind of the over arching theme of the story that that sometimes failure sometimes failure is the thing that leads to the growth that we need to experience uh, Peter did these three things as we talked about welcome Jesus obeyed him and, and and then had that belief in him but ultimately he he, he did this after having first off uh, had a pretty dismal fishing expedition and I wonder what would have happened if that had not been the case. Suppose Peter would have gone out and done really well the night before. Uh, not as well as what Jesus did, but he had his adequate catch. He was able to do all of those things that he needed to do, uh, pay the employees, uh, provide food for his table. Would he have been imp as impressed with the catch that he had with Jesus? I don't think he would have. Now, it still would have been an extraordinary catch, still would have been miraculous, but it wouldn't have quite had the same impact that it did as following Peter not having caught anything the night before. Sometimes God allows those uh, failures, those stumbles in our lives, uh, because He knows that He's going to teach us something from that. He knows that He's going to use those experiences to help us grow in ways that we couldn't have otherwise. You see, the truth is that God's ways are mysterious to us, Sometimes God's ways are difficult for us to understand at the moment, but God's ways are always wonderful in the end. And as His disciples, as His followers, we need to hold on to that. So as we kind of wrap up our time uh, today, how is it that we, we fight off failure when it starts to, to knock on the doors of our hearts or our minds? One, we remember that we're uniquely and wonderfully made by God. The failing is something we do. A failure isn't somebody that we are. We remember that life is better when we include God in it, not just certain portions of it, but all of it, including our work lives. The life is better when we follow God's direction rather than just trying to, to launch out on our own. That life is better when we trust, when we believe, when we have confidence that God can and does answer prayer in His way, which we may not notice or appreciate at the moment, but in ways that are always best. And then finally, by realizing that even when failures do happen, that God can take those and teach us lessons that we might not have otherwise been able to learn. So next time you're tempted to think of yourself as a failure, shift that mindset. View failure as a teacher, uh, not as an undertaker. See failure uh, as a delay, not as defeat. Look to failure as a temporary de detour, not a dead end a street. And remember, as we so wonderfully read in Romans 8, 28, that great promise that God can cause all things, even failure, to work together for good uh, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Amen. You dance over me while I You sing all around, but I never hear the sound. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you.
All right. Thanks so much for being a part of our worship time this morning. Uh, We do hope that all of it has been not only encouraging to you, um, but that God has used us in a manner that is glorifying to him. We're going to wrap up with a final word of prayer. I hope you have a great week. We're moving uh, just about into Fourth of July weekend. So uh, by chance you're going to be taking a trip, do so safely. Um, And uh, let's go ahead and wrap up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the opportunity, God, um, to connect with you and, and, and the recognition that that doesn't just happen on the weekends, Lord, uh, but can be true any moment of every day. Help us to seize that. Um, as we talked about earlier in, in our sermon time, Lord, help us to make sure you're a part of all areas and aspects of our life and not just weekends. God, we ask that you would use us in the week uh, that come, is coming up for us. Uh, may we be your ambassadors, your light in the midst of um, a world that too often is filled with darkness. May our words, may our actions, even our thoughts uh, draw others closer to you. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.